welcome, welcome, hello and welcome to our webcast. Um, the discussion is on direct transfers to citizens, the stimulus the Eurozone needs. That's the question that we are asking today. My name is Catherine Fior. I'm a journalist working largely on EU affairs with EU Reporter, and I'm your moderator. So without further ado, I would like you to, to introduce you to the executive director of Positive Money Europe, former journalist, Stan Jordan is, uh, if, if you don't, if you're not familiar with him, he's the executive director of Positive Money Europe. Uh, Positive Money Europe is a Brussels-based NGO advocating for a fairer, more, more democratic and sustainable economy. Bo uh, so you, uh, if you, some of you may be more familiar with Positive Money UK, and which in some ways acts as an inspiration for this Belgian or version of the organization. And um, I met Stan a long time ago in the European Parliament, and it was actually a discussion on this very, very issue. Uh, what could quantitative easing be doing? How could it become a much more effective tool to strengthen the economy? So Stan, over to you. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for, for joining us today for this webinar. Um, so, as Catherine said, I'm, I'm directing Pussy Money Europe, and indeed, uh, I've, I've, but so Pussy Money Europe is only three years old. We were created in 2018, but already before uh, I was working for Pussy Money uh, in London, and I did uh, quite a few meetings indeed in Brussels to, to, to champion and propose this idea of uh, helicopter money, which at the time we called it quantitative easing for the people because we thought it was a more straightforward uh, description of, of what we wanted to do. But it seems like the literature keeps banging around with this helicopter money idea, which I don't know, was it for better or worse? That's the name we, we, we call this policy now. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, it's been a, a quite a flagship proposal from, from Posimony, uh, this idea of helicopter money, because we think the ECB right now is not really achieving its mandate, or at least has not been achieving it for the last 10 years. And also because we think there's always room for progress. Um, and, um, and I'm really delighted that uh, I don't need to do all the talk about helicopter money today as, as compared to what I do usually because we have two great speakers with us. And I'm really particularly grateful uh, that uh, both of them are with us today. I mean, uh, so Philippe Martin uh, has uh, co-produced with uh, his co-authors an excellent report um, that I think I can say after 10 years of working on this issue, I think it's the closest uh, description of what of the way also we also propose helicopter money so we're really grateful for that report that's really useful to to, to put the idea forward in the years and context especially and uh, also i'm really happy we have claudia uh, sam with us because uh, clearly i've been following your work personally for, for a few years and also a thought leader in in in, uh, in in various forms of well basically giving money to people in in all all various shades of grace of, of doing this thing so i'm sure you'll provide also a US ex ex perspective on this will be um, useful for the debate, especially given the, the kind of post-COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis as well, and what the US has done compared to the Eurozone is quite interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna bore you more with this introductory remark, just to say thank you again for being here. And um, obviously we know the European Central Bank has not taken up electric money during the last strategy review. So it was a disappointment because we felt like uh, Mrs. Lagarde was uh, promised us that she would make sure the ECB would be more open-minded and open to 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 open to other views. But so we were kind of disappointed on this. But we're not giving giving up that easily. I can assure you. Though. So that's why we're having this webinar this webinar now, and to to think about what 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 next can the ECB do. And um, I'm really look, looking forward to listen to learn. And I'm sure as well that the quality of the audience will help uh, make this conversation. Uh, interesting and lively, and uh, thank you in advance for everyone for taking part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Stan, for, for that introduction. Um, so I'd like to introduce now that our, our main speaker of, of, on this paper, Philippe Martin. He's the chairman of the Council of Economic Analysts, the French Council of Economic Analysts. Um, his background, he's a professor of economics at Sciences Po in Paris, and he served as an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and was the economic advisor of Emmanuel Macron when he was Minister of the Economy. 
So, um, as Stan has said, uh, this is uh, about a paper that he authored. It's called What Else Can a European Central Bank Do? So, over to you, Philippe. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. So it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, to talk about this paper and have a discussion. Uh, I'm pretty sure we will, um, we will disagree on things and, and that's going to, to be good because we need to have a debate on, on that. So I think there are several ways to, to, to think about this issue. And I agree with uh, Stanislas that uh, helicopter money is not maybe the best uh, name for, for this instrument, but you know, that's, that's what it is in the literature. So I will we'll use uh, helicopter money. I think in a sense, and that's maybe part of the um, political and economic debate that we need to have, is that one way to think about helicopter money is that strictly it's a tool of monetary policy within the mandate of the central bank, uh, either the Fed in the US or the ECB, and obviously I'm going to focus on the, uh, on the, uh, on the ECB, which is what I know best. Or whether it's more than that, uh, which is it's a tool uh, to redistribute money to, to some households. And in some sense, I guess it's a bit closer uh, to the name you gave it, uh, meaning QE for the people. So let me be completely open. I'm going to take the first route. And I think that, uh, man I mean, going very much towards the second route makes it difficult uh, to, uh, to, 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 um, uh, to push forward uh, the, uh, the helicopter money as an instrument and as a new instrument of, uh, of, of monetary policy. So let me just share my, uh, my slides. Do you see them? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. So, um, oops, 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 oops. okay. So, indeed. So, this is a paper with uh, with uh, Eric Monet and uh, Xavier Hago, with a team of economists at uh, the French Council. And so, in a sense, I would say, and I'm going to maybe disappoint some of you. Uh, if I have to answer your question, uh, is our direct transfers to citizens the stimulus the euro no, so needs? If I add to the question today, I would say no. And I'm going to explain you, but why I say no, but why I would say yes in, uh, in, different, uh, in different circumstances. So we know that uh, in, the, in the Eurozone, the inflation rate is the main uh, mandate of, uh, and target of the ECB. And it's been persistently low, uh, below target since 2015. Huh? The ECB has missed its inflation target uh, in a persistent way, but not today. Uh, today, uh, basically, the inflation rate, and we all think that this is not something persistent, and I'll uh, come back to this, uh, this is something temporary uh, linked to the COVID crisis, to closing down the economy and then opening up. And so we think that this inflation above 3% in the Eurozone, I think in the US it's uh, more like 4 or 5%, uh, uh, is, is high today. And that's the reason why the stimulus the Eurozone needs is not today uh, a, 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 a quantity, uh, helicopter money, uh, the way we described it. However, however, I think that this is an instrument that central banks need to have, uh, basically uh, as, um, as a, in a situation where indeed uh, you have deflationary episodes, which we, with, which we have had in the past, huh? uh, and which we may have again uh, once this inflationary episode is, uh, is behind us. Uh, and it's probably true that if we have another deflationary episode down the road, it will be necessary to increase the balance sheet of uh, the, uh, the, the ECB. And in this case, that means uh, buying more uh, public debt, buying more private debt. And there, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll agree that this is going uh, to cause some, some issues. Uh, there are more and more critics on the collateral effects on, on the instruments, on the standard instrument of QE in terms of inequalities. And we know that this uh, impact on inequalities is actually more on wealth than on, on income, but that's, that's an issue. And in the case of the Eurozone, I won't speak about here about the, uh, uh, the Fed. There's also an issue of, and here it's more German concern of the fiscal dominance risk in the sense that in this case today, 25% uh, of the public debt is held by, by the ECB. So it's a very large amount, which means that the exit strategy 
is not that easy because we know that if the ECB stops buying uh, this public mm -hmm. debt, um, you may have a return of the eurozone crisis with an increase in spreads between uh, 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 some peripheral countries and, and poor countries. Now, in terms of the legal framework, I think actually the legal framework, in this case, the ECB mandate is actually quite flexible. In fact, more than the Fed, uh, from that point of view, we have more flexibility uh, because the mandate is to support the general policies in the EU without prejudice to the price stability. So I think we're not lawyers, but basically, as long as uh, there's no uh, uh, that its operations do not contradict free competition and do not constitute direct or certain financing of governments, actually, we think that there's no obvious legal uh, impediment to uh, to a transfer to 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 our source. Okay, so let me describe it, and 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 I'm going to be very short on that. So, as you understand. The way we, we think about uh, a helicopter money instrument is that it has to be contingent on the fact that inflation is below target and not just for one month, that it's uh, you know, in, a, in a way which is persistently below target, which is not the situation today. And that's the reason why we do not think <laughs> it's, um, it's necessary today. It's a direct transfer to households not to states, uh, because then that would be legal clearly in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Eurozone, in Europe. Uh, so we have, uh, we described quite a lot of uh, papers that show that th the theoretical effects are quite strong. Uh, in many theory, theory papers, indeed, uh, the impact of uh, helicopter money can be strong on, on both um, uh, uh, economic activity and on inflation. And in the paper, actually not in the paper, but in a technical uh, uh, focus uh, uh, um, attached to the paper, we do estimate uh, what transfers to households would mean in terms of inflation in the Eurozone. Okay, so these are uh, um, uh, econometric methods and estimations to see what is the effect on, on, on inflation. So basically, there are, two ways, there are several ways to, to, to look at that. One is to say that um, uh, you have a transfer to consumers and then consumer consumption has an impact on inflation. So basically it's the multiplication of, of two, two elasticities in this case. And we take uh, uh, these elasticities from uh, uh, the literature on, on, on fiscal transfers. Uh, and then another way to, to, uh, to make this estimation is to, look, to estimate the impact of fiscal shocks or fiscal policy uh, 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 which is accompanied by monetary expansion. Because it's true that helicopter money, you can view it as expansionary fiscal policy and expansionary monetary policy at the same time. The interesting thing, and, and, and that makes our estimate quite robust, is that the two methods uh, uh, generate the same type of, uh, of impact, meaning that you would need a 2% GDP transfer to, uh, to households to generate an additional increase in inflation of one percentage point. Right? So, so here, this is the amount of transfer to achieve a 2% target. Remember that really within the mandate of the ECB. So basically, if you have super low inflation uh, in the Eurozone, meaning 0.5% of inflation, you need to generate an additional 1.5% to get to the 2% target. In this case, you, we need a 3% uh, transfer of GDP to households. Uh, so here it's for children, um, uh, for all adults, sorry. And then uh, uh, we give a, a, a transfer for children under 15, which is half of the one uh, given to adults. And so that means around one, a bit more than 1,000 euros per, per, uh, per, uh, per, um, per household, uh, per individual, sorry. Uh, but you see that, and it's linear, huh? basically, if it's a 1%, uh, 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 um, uh, if the inflation uh, is 1% and you need to add one percentage point of inflation, basically, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, around 800 euros, et cetera. And the important thing is that it's not every year. Huh? It, uh, once you attain the inflation target of 2%, you stop it. So the exit strategy from that point of view is uh, relatively easy. So you stop the transfer and you announce it as, as stopping, you stop the transfer 
uh, once you get to uh, to uh, to inflation around uh, around two percent. So from that point of view, we think that the exit strategy is uh, is easier than uh, the monetary strategy that the ECB has now. Obviously, there are lower collateral effects in terms of inequalities, but also in terms of fiscal dominance. We can uh, talk again about uh, inequalities. We think also it's particularly well suited to the Eurozone fiscal coordination problems. In a sense, but maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, we're going to have a, a different, uh, a different uh, discussion with, uh, with Claudia on, on the US, is that in the US, uh, we've seen uh, there was big transfer uh, uh, in the Biden stimulus uh, program uh, at the federal level. Obviously, uh, in Europe, we can't do that. So there's an issue of coordination. Uh, uh, we can't have uh, this uh, fiscal transfer uh, at the federal level to uh, European households. And so from that point of view, as often, it's the ECB, which, is, uh, which in some sense is going to be in charge of this European coordination. Um, and so from that point of view, because there's no EU fiscal policy, it's true that the EU monetary policy necessarily is going to interact with fiscal policy, which means it's, we, and, and, and we recognize that that means there's a bit of a gray uh, zone uh, uh, between fiscal dominance and, and, and monetary dominance and the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy. And that's my last point. That means that this requires um, some sort of coordination between monetary authorities and fiscal authorities, because obviously we do not want uh, to provide to make this transfer by the ECB that would be undone uh, by one government that would say, okay, I'm going to tax completely this uh, fiscal, this monetary transfer to reduce, for example, my debt. Huh? So that would mean that from, from that point of view, there would have to be some sort of commitment uh, that the, uh, the, the tax system is not changed so as to tax the, 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 the helicopter. Okay, lovely. And let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Philippe. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm now going to have a reaction from uh, Claudia Sam. Uh, and uh, Claudia, for those who don't know her, is a, a senior fellow researching guaranteed income at the Jane Family Institute. She was formerly the director of macroeconomic policy at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth and a section chief at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. She was also a senior economist with, at the Council of uh, Economic Advisors in the Obama administration, uh, where she worked on macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic development uh, and housing policy. So over to you, Claudia. Great. Philippe, could you stop sharing? Oh, yeah, there that's we it. go. Thanks. You did it right as I was asking. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Let me, oh, come on. Sorry, just a second. Get this to be big. All right. Okay. So first of all, I really appreciate the chance to be here. I think this is an important topic. I'm going to disagree some with Philippe, but, but the broad goal I very much share in that we have to think about tools to make sure that whenever we have a crisis, we get to the other side of it as quickly as possible and as equitably as possible. So I, it is, it's clear that we, we need to change the tools. We need to think, hard. like monetary policy has, is not enough. We knew that after the uh, global financial crisis in 2008, we've learned a lot in the COVID crisis about where monetary policy, frankly, in my opinion, falls short. And in particular, the tools that we have right now with the quantitative easing. So uh, I'll come at this a little different, but we probably agree more than it might sound. Um, Okay, so first, and this just reinforces why we need to spend time really thinking hard about and potentially giving central banks new tools and new mandates. So central banks are facing a whole range of challenges at this very moment. Uh, you have their mandates of price stability in the United States. There's also maximum employment. As we are coming out of the COVID recovery, this is challenging. As Philippe mentioned, we're seeing some inflation we haven't seen in a long while. And as in all recoveries, it's not even. The United States has many layers of labor markets 
and those at the bottom do not and have never functioned well. So it's, it's really challenging. Uh, the Fed put in place a new framework a few years ago, which actually upped the ante in terms of what it was trying to do. And it's the, this now and the next year will be the biggest test of the Fed. And frankly, I think central banks around the world since the 1980s. So fingers crossed. Um, okay, so the other thing that's gotten a lot of discussion, both in the United States and, and frankly in Europe was leading on this, is the challenge to central banks in thinking about how their frameworks, how their policies should potentially adapt to the risks of climate change. So this is very much still in kind of an intellectual stage and maybe some stress testing, but this is a big challenge that central banks are facing that frankly, <clears throat> as much interest for central banks, this is, I think, actually, to me, it was kind of surprising. I don't think of the Fed as the one who's going to fix this, but it has a role to play. Um, and then finally, we just, we, the Fed, the central banks need new tools. We're in a low interest rate environment. The primary tool they've had is moving interest rates, whether it's a policy rate, those are at zero, or it's doing asset purchases to try and put pressure on short-term, long-term interest rates. We know from quantitative easing, I mean, it's contested, but pretty clear uh, that there is a there are some negative side effects of quantitative easing. It has a lot of influence in asset markets and like those aren't equal, right? Like, so it, it has created some problems. Um, I don't think that means the central bank should, you know, take the foot off the gas right now. But I mean, we've got to, we have to think about that. And that is just a reality of those tools. Okay. Um, I do have some concerns about expanding the Fed's ability to do direct transfers. Now, the institutional, the political uh, setup could be, it sounds, it is very different in Europe whether the ECB is the one that actually sends the money out. Like, I'm not concerned about that. The Fed, great set of pipes, right? Like it can be a very technocratic, very effective way to get money out. But that mandate, like that to me is a different mandate. I wouldn't want the lawyers having to, you know, parse the text. I really think that's one that should come from policymakers. That's like, no, we want you to do this. And in the absence of that, um, I, I am very concerned that you would be giving unelected central bankers very powerful tools without being um, accountable to voters, to the populace. Um, central banks, the tools they have are about moving an economy overall, uh, supporting a financial market in crisis overall. When you start sending money out, you have you pick winners and losers. You pick amounts, you pick who gets it, you pick how long. Those to me are decisions that elected officials should be making. Central banks can carry those out, but I think we ask, and you've seen, there's been some aspects in the United States of some politicians, particularly more progressive, pushing the Fed to do things that like they might kind of sort of be able to do, but they don't have a clear mandate from Congress. So I do get, I like to think creative. I like to think about all the things central banks could do, but I want them to be told by elected officials. Um, and, and that holds in a lot of areas. Like in the United States, Congress needs to lead on climate change. Like acting like the Fed is gonna be the leader is both, like it just doesn't make sense. And, and there are issues with inequality that are the same thing. The Fed can be an assist, the Fed cannot lead. Um, they just don't have the tools. And it, it's just like conceptually, the framework would be just weird. Um, okay, so just a couple of charts to underscore some of these points. Okay, we got to get real here. Like interest rates are not going to be the thing that pushes us um, out into it, like well into a recovery quickly. If businesses were not investing before COVID, it was not because interest rates were too high, right? Like there's much more of activity thinking about future sales, profits for households, what's my career look like? Like that's really the thing that pushes behavior. Interest rates have an effect. I don't say they, they have no effect, but the world has changed in terms of how powerful interest rates, regardless of how you, the central banks push them around, like they're not, they're not what they once were like back in the eighties. 
Um, the other thing, and this just underscores why we have got to get serious about uh, the quantitative easing, like the straight up kind, not the one for the people. Uh, the straight up kind is, is really, uh, like we have so much wealth and equality to have a policy that increases it is just like, we, we just, we got to get real and figure out a way not to do that. In the United States, these are some relatively new statistics from the Federal Reserve. In the middle of this year, the top 1% of households in the US by wealth held $43 trillion, the bottom half, 3 trillion, right? Like this is, this is a big problem. The Fed did not create this problem. The Fed is not going to solve this problem, right? Unless we really get into these direct transfers, but like it's making it worse. Right, like this, this has to stop. Um, these numbers, they're just mind boggling. Like, um, okay, so, but I, I do wanna affirm like direct transfers, getting money to people and small business, like these things help, they really do. And we learn, it is, um, as someone who has done a lot of research on stimulus checks, you know, research showing that these are really effective like the best we, we can help families in a crisis. I had proposals on how to tie them to economic conditions, which I think, you know, Philippe talked about how do you know when to do this? Like this is really important um, so that they can just go on autopilot. And I was just like, I, I can't believe how, how good the policy was uh, in the United States. And I kind of laugh when you calibrate how big the transfer should be um, in the United States. The first year of COVID, there were three rounds of stimulus checks. A family of four in the United States got over $11,000. It was almost 20% of median family income. And for black families, it was 25% of median income. I mean, that's just like amazing. Now, like, it worked, right? I just, the discussions over inflation right now just drive me almost completely like just over the edge, um, because at the end of the day, it's the ability of people to buy what they need, right? And this chart is showing you the comparison of the Great Recession, where frankly, we just didn't do enough. Like we asked the Fed to do everything. The Fed does not have these tools and Congress walked away and threw it in reverse. Bad, bad, bad. Europe, y'all didn't do a whole lot better. Um, actually, maybe worse. Uh, so, but what you can see in the US is this, uh, the, just the income that went out was massive in difference. And, and I'm not showing it here, but when we look at spending adjusted for inflation, taking out the inflation now, it is night and day, right? Like we, cons consumer spending inflation adjusted in the United States is it recovered. Like this is so important to get us out of recovery quickly. This was a big deal and it really worked. So I think there's a question about how we get this money out, but in a crisis, money in people's pockets is so much more effective than interest rates. Um, anyway, so I won't get into this, but I do think like fiscal policy really has a big role to play both in, in crises and recoveries, but also like, I mean, at the end of the day, where this is at is long-term sustainable growth, equitable growth, dynamic economies. That's a whole other problem we've had with like slowing growth and lower productivity. So I just think we have to be careful of putting too much attention on central banks because they just fundamentally are not set up to solve all the problems. They do a lot and we should keep improving them, but you know, it's a balancing act. So, Hello. So, yes, so thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, I don't know if, uh, Philip, you want to come back and say something immediately, or I could uh, return to turn to the, some of the questions that are being asked. I mean, no, I mean, I, I, I think I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Claudia said. I think uh, we, we might have a debate on, on whether the amount of the stimulus in, in the US compared to the uh, stimulus in Europe was too big, too small, whatever. But I think it's better to maybe come back and, uh, and, and talk about the helicopter money and, and maybe some of the questions in the audience. Lovely. So um, a question, uh, if I could ask you to put questions through the Q&A largely, I see there's one question that's come through the chat. So I'll read this 
first, but uh, there will be, but please place your questions in the Q&A. So um, who should be driving the process for helicopter money to happen? If ECB does not feel it has a mandate, who should give this mandate and, and encourage them to use it? Obviously in the circumstances where you think it should be used, Philippe, what would you say to that? Um, so so it's, it's a difficult question because it's true that I think that without the support of the governments, um, I don't think that uh, the ECB uh, would do it and should do it actually, because it's true that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not obvious from a legal point of view, from a political point of view, uh, that the ECB or a, uh, any central bank can do it. And I think Claudia was right to say that there's a question which is not so, 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 so easy to answer about an elected uh, uh, central bankers uh, doing these transfers. Um, I, I would say that indeed, if it's the central bank that does it, it has to do it with the objective of indeed increasing the inflation rate, not of decreasing the uh, uh, inequalities, because that's, that's the mandate of governments, that's a political mandate. And that's the reason why uh, I would say it's a transfer, equal transfer to all citizens, whether rich or poor. Uh, it, uh, if, if after that, the governments uh, different governments we know have marginal rates of, uh, of taxes which are different. The only thing I would say is that there needs to be coordination so that the, you know, the, the, the French government does not come and say, okay, you gave 1,000 euros to uh, Philippe Martin, we're going to tax uh, 1,000 euros to Philippe Martin, because then in this case, it's direct money to the governments and that's something different. Uh, yeah. I I think it's a really interesting question about what these payments should be tied to. So it, it, it absolutely, in agreeing here, should be tied to some kind of an economic indicator, right? It's not that governments have to get together and say, let's send the money out. I mean, that's what this discretionary fiscal policy when the United States with the stimulus checks, they had Congress had to get together and vote and you know send the money out. If you wanna put that on autopilot, which I think is very useful. And in the case where a central bank would be delivering it, like you really need to set up those boundaries um, ahead of time. So there it's set it to some kind of economic indicator. For the United States, I have advocated using the unemployment rate. I mean, that fits also better because of the maximum employment mandate. But frankly, and doing a little bit of analysis in Europe, your automatic stabilizers, the way you fight recessions is fundamentally different. Like there's no way the unemployment rate is the right measure in Germany because they have efforts to keep workers on the job. I don't, I'm not sure I, how I feel exactly about Eurozone inflation levels, but I can see the, the argument for it. I think we just have to be really careful about institutional differences across countries in fiscal policy could make recessions manifest themselves in these kind of aggregate eurozone wide inflation. So I think that's a challenge, but I mean, honestly, for someone who came up with a recession indicator for the United States, there's nothing magical about it. You just gotta look at the data and try and find a regularity that you know is there. So, okay. but you need one. So I agree with that. Catherine, uh, you don't have your microphone on. Mute. Apologies. <laughs> Sorry. So I have a question from François Xavier Oliveau. He asks: Arguably, central banks do have current do have currently a massive power, despite being unelected. A government-provided mandate or distributing an equal lump sum per capita tied to an objective inflation measure, as Philippe described would actually decrease their discretionary power? It's not asked in the form of a question, but um, could you, do you have a response to that, Philippe? Um, would that decrease their, this, I mean, their, their mandate is inflation. Uh, now they're pretty free in terms of instruments to, to get to that uh, target in terms of inflation. Um, 
so it's true the government provided mandate i mean it's already there actually in terms of the mandate is already there you don't need uh, that the government say to the ecb uh, you have a two percent inflation uh, maybe the european parliament needs to uh, to remind uh, the ecb that it has failed uh, to obtain the to attain the uh, inflation rate of two percent in the from 2015 to, to 2020 and to ask questions you know what are you doing about uh, uh, about this so i don't think we need any necessary extra mandate we already have it um, now the problem is you know to what extent this instrument this new instrument is 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 changing completely uh, the way we think about monetary policy and where indeed it's a bit sensitive from a political point of view is that we need some form of coordination with fiscal policy, uh, especially in, uh, in, in Europe. And, and, and it's true that for a long time, economists, uh, politicians say, okay, monetary policy on one side, fiscal policy on the other side, we completely separate. They have to be completely independent. I understand the argument and I share some of the, the concern of having a completely integrated fiscal and monetary policy world. But I think we have to be uh, a bit less hypocrite. And, and we need to say that indeed there has to be more coordination between fiscal and monetary policy with different roles, but with coordination. Yeah, and I oh, think yeah. the way, because uh, like, um, just like saying the word helicopter money, it's like, yeah, that's not quite. Saying fiscal monetary coordination just like makes my heart beat a little faster. Um, but I think a way I would frame, I mean, I do agree that you've got two pieces, two policies that are, need to row in the same direction in a time of crisis. So I agree with that. The way I like to frame it as central banks, like uh, policy, elected officials using central banks as a way to put to fight recessions a way like this extra piece of uh, central banks will always have these interest rate tools right like that that's just a piece of their toolkit but if you want to think about okay how do we get direct payments out during a crisis i mean the ecb the fed very competent they have pipes in the financial system get money out like it makes sense why you would look to them but you could have fiscal authorities sending money out so it's really not a coordination like that those money drops it's more about the central bank being the tool that elected officials use i think it's best if you agree about how they'll be used beforehand but then it's really not you know like what you were showing Philippe, about like at what uh level of inflation how big the payment should be to people like those things are decided ahead of time where you would get into the danger zone of coordination which is not what you're proposing is the ECB sends out a round of checks of money, and then the fiscal authority comes back and says, oh, let's do more, let's do more, right? And puts pressure on the central bank to keep pumping money out more and more. But if you have these rules set up ahead of time, it's, um, it's really, it would be one small piece of rule-based monetary policy. Right. Like I think a lot of monetary policy should be discretionary, but you could imagine it as this little piece. And then it's really not coordination anymore, because um, I do think we have to think and guard very much against that, because we know that has not led to good, good things in the past. But if I can just say one thing, our proposal is rule based. It's yeah, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. If you had 2% inflation, the ECB uh, does not provide transfer. And I see there's a question on actually uh, the fact that it has to go through the treasury. No, I mean, the, the ECB, I mean, it's not so, so, so easy. It would make it more easy if we have digital uh, uh, money. Uh, but uh, but the ECB has the possibility to transfer money directly to bank accounts, to private bank accounts. And it ha does not need to go through treasuries. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I was just pushing back on using the word coordination. Yeah. I don't think you need to use that word because that's not what it is. And yeah, you're right. Central banks print money, right? And they have access into financial, like the banking system. So they actually, we might be much better off taking treasury out of the equation because they don't have the same connections to bank accounts that central banks do. 
I've got um, a number of interesting questions from uh, Simon Thorpe uh, on how on the workings of it. Uh, he asks a few questions here. He says, should payments to citizens be equal for all Eurozone citizens? Uh, he asks, if the ECB gave money to citizens, what percentage would be used for consumption and what would be used to pay off debt? And, and finally, he has, uh, should the EB, uh, could the ECB uh, also impose an FFT on all euro denominated transactions to remove money from the system, not raise taxes? Um, there would be no, so I'm not, I don't even understand that last question, but so it, it, you probably do understand it. What, what is your answer to Simon on all those issues? So these are super interesting questions. Uh, let me start with the, in some sense, it's not an easy one, but that's the, the, the maybe a important one from a quantitative point of view, which is basically linked to uh, if I give 100 uh, euros, how much is saved and how much is consumed. If everything is saved, then we're doomed huh? uh, because uh, then that means there won't be any impact on any impact on economic activity. Uh, the, 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 the studies, the empirical studies on transfers to, uh, to, uh, to households uh, vary quite a lot on what we call the marginal propensity to consume, but basically it's between 30% and 70%. Okay, so if you and that's the way we actually get the impact on inflation. Okay, so 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 um, transfers that are given and and it's obviously quite heterogeneous depending on who you give it to. Um, uh, low income households have a marginal propensity to consume, which is higher. But and that's uh, related to the next question: Should we give it, you know, the same amount to everybody? Um, Yes, it may not be most the most efficient thing to do, and it's the and and the one that uh, reduces inequality the most. But again, coming back to um, the fact that there's a big political dimension in this process, I think you have to be as neutral as possible uh, because otherwise it's not it's it's really politically charged. So indeed. Everybody gets the, the same amount. Now in Europe, and this is a very interesting question and, and to be completely truthful, we had a lot of debates among us and I'm not sure we, we came to a very good decision. Is basically the question is, do you give the same amount to um, citizens of Germany and to citizens of Cyprus? And it's not completely obvious because on the one hand, indeed, if you give the same amount, uh, then in a sense, you're giving more in real terms or relative to the GDP per capita to those of uh, uh, Cyprus than to Germany. Um, it's not obvious. And I don't have a definitive answer to, to this, uh, because on the other hand, you could say that depending on the, if you look at the keys uh, uh, at the ECB in the capital, um, then you would give more to German citizens than to uh, citizens of Cyprus. But then it opens another. So, so I don't have a, a, a very good answer to that, but that's an interesting debate, which we have not uh, uh, resolved uh, successfully. Yeah, so I first want to say we are totally singing from the same choir on the, the questions about the, the size, the targeting. Um, so what we know from the United States, and I've spent a, a decade now studying stimulus checks, what people do with them, different kinds of relief that are given to households in recessions. And, and I agree, I think the estimate is probably somewhere between a third and 50%, maybe more. It does kind of, I think, go towards durable, particularly if you have big checks, like the size of the check matters too. Um, but it happens fast. Right. So if you're going to spend it, you spend it quickly. That is exactly what we need in a recession. The bigger the dollars are, you know, the more the 30 percent, the 50 percent like kicks through the the issue about saving. So and this will vary by country. Some, uh, you know, uh, economic saving is also paying off debt. Right. And and what we're trying to do in recession is not just about stimulating the economy. That is important. That gets inflation, you know, or labor markets going. There's also this aspect of relief, right? Paying down a credit card debt, being able to pay your mortgage, your rent. Like these are really important things. And if you can't do that, 
you're going to have to cut back somewhere else. Um, in mo like households in the United States will do their service, their debt, like if they can, like they will pay them more. They'll find a way to do it. And if they don't have the income, they're going to trade off with something else. And then that causes, uh, you know, problems in the economy. Like families that are weathering the storm are going to be good for the overall economy, right? Whether whatever the MPC is, right? So, um, so I think that's where these checks are good. I think keep it simple, right? The more targeting you do, the more tying it to local economic conditions, the more muddy the waters get. In a recession, it people lose a lot of income. In the United States during COVID, 50% of US households lost some income from employment. Our safety net is not y'all's like, tw only 20% of those who lost employment income got jobless benefits in the US. So we had some big holes to plug. I mean, at the very top, like the US, the top 20% of households by income didn't get it. Fine, if that's what it takes, but I would not do very like tight income targets because you're gonna miss people because everything moved around so much. Um, yeah, I know there are other issues with equity, like the different countries in Europe, but I, I was very supportive of, you know, $1,000 goes far, farther in Topeka, Kansas than in New York City, but just send the money out, right? I mean, those are disparities you can kind of work with that came in before. So I wouldn't get too fancy, totally agree with that. I, that last question that had to do with, the taxes and the payment. Again, I would not get too fancy. And if we like tax authorities should be on the fiscal side. Um, and if that was anything about clawing back and paying for it later, I think we should just focus on like getting out of the recession and spending money like to get it done. Um, so yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Martin Soko. He asks Philip, um, Philip, uh, Philip is arguing that central banks do not have a mandate to increase inequalities, which is true. But is it also true that they do not have a mandate to increase equality? Uh, uh, yet that is what they're effectively doing uh, in their current actions. So why do we allow that? So what, what would you say to uh, Martin, Philip? I don't think the... The debate is as stark as, uh, as, as, as here. I mean, if you look at the empirical estimates of the impact of monetary policy on inequality, I don't think it's as black and white as, as this. The literature uh, has shown that uh, the impact on inequality depends on whether you look at inequality in income and inequality in wealth. On income, uh, it's actually the reverse. And I do believe that actually the, the empirical literature says that an expansionary monetary policy, because it generates more activity, it lowers unemployment, and especially unemployment for the low skilled and, 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 and low income people, it's going to reduce income inequality because it's going to help uh, those with, uh, so, so an expansionary monetary policy reduces income inequality. And, and QE is part of an expansionary policy. Um, and, 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 and therefore, from that point of view, I would not say that uh, central banks should, uh, should not do QE uh, for, for that reason. It does reduce, it's not as effective as it used to be because we are in the decreasing returns of monetary policy from that point of view. Now, QE, and that's the second part of my answer, it's true, uh, on, on wealth. Because QE, part of QE is to buy assets, and that means an increase in the price of financial assets, and that we know is very concentrated on the top decides or top uh, percentile of, of uh, wealth distribution, whether in Europe or in the US, uh, then in this case, yes, monetary policy is going to increase, uh, to increase in, uh, wealth inequality. But be careful, you know, when monetary policy was decreasing or increasing interest rates, it also had, uh, um, it also had a, 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 an impact on, 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 on inequality. So um, I, I think it's true that QE has some sort of collateral damage on wealth inequality, but frankly saying, okay, so we're going to undo, uh, we have to undo QE 
in this case, you would increase income inequality and decrease wealth inequality. So I don't think that it's so stark, and I think and 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 that's not the right way to think about uh, this issue. It's it's a bit more subtle than that. Yeah, no, and I would just to reinforce that there there's a discussion, at least in the United States. I'm not sure how much this has gone across the, the, the ocean, but um, that people there have been some advocates for the Fed pulling back doing fewer asset purchases, potentially raising interest rates because there is this wealth inequality, right? In addition to quantitative easing, uh, the central banks, I mean, their primary historical focus has been lender of last resort. I mean, there was a complete disaster brewing in March of 2020 in financial markets. The Fed, the Fed saves Wall Street. Right? Like that's kind of what they're supposed to do. And, and it would be very bad for everyone if like the US Treasury market had really broken. Oh, that was very scary. Um, but so, I mean, it's clear that the Fed is having actions and, and reactions in asset markets. Those are unequal. But the idea that you would want the Fed to fight back on that by reducing its support of the economy is just mind blowing to me because that would be the opposite to the point about the income inequality, that would be totally the opposite thing you would want to do if you were concerned about inequality, right? So, but to me, that just speaks to the point that either through a fiscal federal authority, or I guess it could be local, but through a fiscal authority or from a monetary authority, like you've got to figure out more effective tool, tools like cash, right? Like you can offset, a, you know, a bad effect could be more than offset by a positive effect from a different policy. So, but I have been very concerned, like that discussion about inequality and in the in central banks and how it should make the, like, I just think that's an extremely misguided and would be very harmful to people. So. Yeah. If I can just add very something small. In, in Europe, remember in 2011, the ECB refused to do QE and actually increase interest rates. So it had a restrictive monetary policy. And that's the reason why we had the Eurozone crisis. And that increased tremendously the inequalities in Europe. So I don't think we want that, that at all. Yeah, and you all almost took us back into a global recession. I was at the Fed. That was a little scary <laughs> watching. But yeah, no, I, yes, that's, a problem if that's a reason or there were other reasons potentially too about why not to okay. Claudia my, my apologies for us doing no, that no, to no. you <laughs> so um I've got a question here from Caroline White do the panelists have an, an opinion on how or whether helicopter money whether you like that term or not could play a useful role in making the financial sector growth independent i.e helping it to function effectively in circumstances of sustained economic stagnation or contraction. And she says she asks this because of, uh, whoops, it's move. she asks this because of the considerable research indicating that we can't count on sustained economic growth in the future, um, owing to ecological limits. Very timely when we are about to uh, preparing ourselves for COP26. So, um, Philip, what, what is your response to, to Caroline? So here I'm not, uh, I think that it, you can't ask too much from helicopter money. Uh, so helicopter money is here to uh, increase spending, consumption, and inflation. Now, uh, I think what is uh, uh, um, behind this question is that we are going to need to have huge investments for the ecological transition. So we're going to need a lot of public funds. And how are we going to finance the transition? That's, I think, what's behind it. Should it be the easy, I mean, should, should the monetary policy do, uh, do its uh, job? So in a sense, by lowering interest rates and by enabling uh, governments to borrow to finance uh, this financial transition, the uh, central banks are already uh, doing quite a bit. And here, I think that, yes, uh, the ecological transition, the, uh, the climate change is going to require huge amounts of, 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 uh, of investments, but that's the role of fiscal policy. And I think that there's a bit of a problem when politicians start to uh, say, okay, we need to do a lot of public investment, uh, but we're not going to uh, raise taxes uh, to, to finance these investments. That's a political decision. 
uh, whether you tax the rich, you tax everybody, uh, and whether uh, you finance this investment. So here, I think that's not the role of the uh, of the central banks. What is true is that it's certainly uh, right that uh, if uh, this transition has an impact on the economic uh, uh, situation and has uh, some sort of deflationary impact by uh, low, then in this case, uh, yes, uh, the central bank could uh, could react potentially through this instrument, but not directly. No, that's that's the role of governments. Yeah. I'd like to just quickly add one piece onto that. So in I think there is a space in which the the central banks could run lending facilities that again, the, the fiscal authority is determining, but in the financial crisis, we saw for the first time the Federal Reserve had lending facilities authorized by Congress that were directed at Main Street. State and local governments could borrow uh, medium-sized businesses. Now that's a very and it you know they have the capacity to, you know, bar like to take and buy the the municipal bonds and do these kind of things. So you could imagine, and you know, it's from the Fed printing money, right? So it goes on the balance sheet of the central bank and not the federal government. So you could imagine a way that that system, again, it's just like central banks have a good connection to the banking system and can get money in people's bank accounts. They also could be a place to run lending facilities that are very specific to climate change. But again, to Philippe's point, like this is like fiscal authorities have to put the boundaries on that. And it's just using a central bank as a tool again. So, you know. And, and just to make a point that maybe is not uh, politically popular, but uh, helicopter money is not free money. There's no free money on the table. Uh, that's just not, I mean, printing money is not uh, producing real resources. If you think, if you believe uh, that uh, growth is going to be low in the future because we need to reduce growth because of climate change, that central banks should not do anything on that and cannot do anything about that. Mm -hmm. That's real. That's, you know, resources, ecology, climate, that's something real. Money is, is, is nominal. So basically you can print money, that's not, gonna, that's not gonna help in terms of climate change, in terms of technology, et cetera. It can help in the short term to uh, increase economic activity. So you get back to a lower unemployment rate to a higher inflation rate, but that's not, there's no magic into that. Please, please, please don't, don't believe that you know, <laughs> money is magic and you can just print it and you'll solve the problems. No, yeah. the climate problems are super real, super difficult. And it's the, 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 the responsibility of, of elected governments to take care of that, not of unelected uh, officials. Right. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. I'm afraid our time has come to an end, but I think it's been a very, very enlightening discussion. And I'm extremely grateful to Philippe and also to Claudia for their input. I think it's, um, it's a debate that will keep going. Um, it may not be pertinent at this particular moment, but uh, maybe it is something that's in the toolbox and that we could use at a later stage at the when when it would be a valuable contribution to to to, to helping us out of a, a you know a dark, a dark spot um uh, there's no magic apparently which is very disappointing to learn <laughs> <laughs> that's to say um but i'd like to thank you both very much again i'd like to thank all the participants and i'm sorry i couldn't ask her all your questions um but uh, do stay in touch with Positive Money Europe. Do find out uh, what you know, their, their latest thinking is on these matters. So thank you very much indeed.